church a small thing and uh, when we're planting a church it, it's like oh wow you know it's, this is not uh, that big of a place uh, well we're in the studio and we're not a big of a place here but our audience is growing <laughs> and so we're part of a global people often say to me they say jay john you know what what do you do uh, it's always very difficult to know what to say because if I say to you that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up certain images in people's minds as to what I might be. So I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane at Heathrow Airport. And I said, hello. And she said, well, hello. And I said, where are you going? And she says, I'm going to Singapore. Then she said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Australia. I said, what do you do? So she told me. Then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we do marriage work. We've got orphanages. We've got feeding programs, educational programs. I said, we do all sorts of justice and reconciliation things. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death and we deal in the area of behavioral alteration. <laughs> She went, wow! And it was so loud, her wow. Loads of people turned around and looked at us. She says, what's it called? I said, it's called the church. <laughs> really isn't it if we are a follower of Jesus wow. then we are part of a global That's enterprise right. but not only is it global it's intergalactic because it includes everyone that's gone before us wow <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to be one of those that do exploits uh, to be one of those that love the Lord uh, like it's mentioned in Daniel 11:32. You need to change your vision, and, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk, talk about exploits, and in Daniel 11.32 our verse says, But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So how many of you would like to be strong? Now I'm not going to ask how many of you would like to do exploits, because they're together. They come together. So if you're, you become strong in order to do the exploits. And what is, does this mean to do exploits? And that's uh, the theme for this morning. Next week we're going to learn how to do the exploits, but today we're going to, to try to understand what is this, the exploits. Now, Jesus did many miracles, and those were exploits. Um, an exploit and a miracle are not the same thing, but a miracle is a form of an exploit. The Bible says that God anointed Jesus with the uh, uh, Holy Spirit and power. So he went around everywhere doing good. And he was delivering those who were oppressed by the devil. So that, that was Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission was a supernatural mission. He was called to destroy the work of the devil. Is that a good thing? Yes. You know that the devil wants to destroy you, but you're called to destroy his work. Uh, we're not called to destroy him, because you can't, God will do it, but you can't destroy his works. And when you do exploits, you destroy the works of the devil. It's like uh, doing uh, things in a new territory. Uh, well, there's all those miracles registered, but also John said that he performed many other signs and wonders that are not registered in the Gospels. So the Gospels give us, give us a registry of uh, 37 extraordinary miracles and other uh, exploits and things that Jesus did, but he did many other. It's not just uh, uh, limited to the Gospel. One day we'll know about those miracles. Um, now, his 12 then were trained. He trained 12 people, and when the 12 were sent, uh, they also walked in power. They had healing and deliverance ministries, all of them. So they, they were going around doing the works of Jesus. 
They were not just, uh, you know, talking about the kingdom of God. They were demonstrating the kingdom of God. And we need to demonstrate the kingdom of God. Now, uh, in certain circles, uh, uh, more charismatic Pentecostal circles, the idea of demonstrating the kingdom of God, it's uh, when uh, healings or deliverance or something happens. But that's not what God called us to be. God called us to expand the kingdom, not just uh, you know, uh, manifesting the power of God in that way, but there's many other ways how the power of God is manifested. And, um, and I'll, I'll develop this a little bit further. Now, it wasn't just the 12, but he sent 70. And the 70 had the same results as the 12, the same results of Jesus. So something was being uh, passed from uh, one person to another. What we call an anointing, a, a power, a gift that was expanding. Now, not just to 12. And then after the ascension, they continue to grow. You see here a map of Europe, just to give you an example. You see those brown uh, areas? Uh, that's where the, the church was around the year 300. So the church was in those uh, brown areas. You see, there was a little bit uh, here, Seville, a little bit there, that's Lisbon, a little bit uh, here in Egypt, a little bit in Judea, uh, in Turkey, in, in Italy, a little bit in France. Uh, spread into Britain and but during the next 300 years it went all to the yellow areas so this is just Europe not talking about India and other places that we don't even know uh, you know we, we don't have record of how far they, they reached but by the year 600 all of Europe was considered a, a Christian so that's quite an exploit <laughs> if you think about it that's quite an exploit and um, in uh, our days, and uh, again, I don't know how accurate this map is, but uh, I was uh, trying to get the latest uh, census in the spread of Christianity, uh, the, the one before, and, and the one before, please. And uh, here you see the darker areas are the regions that are considered, they have more than 90% uh, Christians. Look at South America and Mexico, that's great. Canada and the States fall a little bit behind. And then you have all these areas uh, here in, in Africa, certain areas in Europe, Australia. So the darker it is, the higher percentage of people that say we're Christian. Isn't that awesome? So think about this. It started with Jesus, the 12, the 70, and spread it literally throughout the world. And sometimes we have this narrow-minded idea that people don't want to know about God and, uh, and that people are, you know, rejecting God. You know, that's Hollywood stuff. That's, uh, that's what the, uh, you know, liberal, uh, you know, communist media wants to uh, pass. That, you know, there's no need for God. And now people that are really advanced and developed, they don't need God. Look at the map of the world. It tells me a complete different thing. And I got the census from 2011. Christianity has almost 2 billion people and far behind there's Islam with about uh, 1 billion and then you have Hinduism and Buddhism and, and uh, th th this is amazing because the only religion that is all over the world in every single country is Christianity. Come on, isn't, not, isn't that an exploit? <laughs> You know, then sometimes you think, oh, you know, the, 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 the radical Islamics are coming and all of this. No, radical Islamists are 100,000. Christians are 2 billion. I think there's a, quite a difference over there. That's what people say. Because, again, uh, when we, we look at this and we, uh, uh, 2 billion, uh, which makes about one third of the world population. You know, Christianity is bigger than the two next religions combined which is uh, Muslim and Hindu. And people say, oh, Muslim religion grows a lot. Well, they have a lot of kids. Uh, and and that, that's how they grow. Now, uh, church is growing, not, not with uh, natural kids, but with spiritual kids. <laughs> and that's the greatest difference. So, uh, Christianity is about 68% larger than the Muslim religion. And that's about to change because as the church does exploits, we will see a decrease in all these false religions and we'll see an increase in the true and only 
true, uh, only religion that God intended, which is Christianity. I think that's great news. And I wanted to mention this as we talk about exploits. Now this is religion in Canada, census from 2010. So the darker, it's people that say they're Roman Catholic. This one here, it's uh, uh, like Greek Orthodox and uh, Russian Orthodox. This one here, it's the Evangelical Christians. And if you see the green there, it's the Muslim in Canada. Can you say wow? wow. <laughs> so so that, that's the census from our government. Now, I'm not telling you that we have like uh, almost 70% Christians, because we know Quebec, and in Quebec, uh, you know, they say, people say that they're Christian, and we know that they're not. Amen. All right? So in Quebec, 82% of people say to the census they're Roman Catholic. Are they? No. I don't think they are. However, here's an accurate number. We have less than 1% evangelical Christians or biblical Christians in Quebec. So all of the 82% of people, and the, the evangelical are there, that say we're Christian, how many of them go to church? How many of them, you know, really believe in Christ as their Savior, how many of them are really saved. So these numbers don't mean a lot. Mean something when you look at things and you look at the scope of things. And uh, actually, uh, as we see what, uh, what happened with radical uh, uh, Muslim attacks in our area, how people suddenly woke up and they say, no, no, we don't want mosques in our community. You know, this is, this is not what we want. People are doing some kind of, you know, extreme things. Why are they doing this? Because there's a time and there's a season when the church is called to do exploits. And sometimes people are asleep and they need to wake up. And let me tell you that I believe that uh, when, when we walk in exploits, miracles are going to happen. And that's why this was my long introduction. Now I'm going to narrow it down to some points. Because uh, we need to see things with a different perspective. You know, when 82% of people in Quebec say, I'm a Christian, they're not. At least they're open to hear about Christ. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons we're here in Passion Canada is here. We do all these different ministries. But uh, I, let me talk a little bit about exploits. A miracle, it's an exploit. But it's, it's, exploits is not just miracles, but let me talk about these, these, uh, these miracles. There's, in theology, those that are called, the, the, it's a difficult word for me, cessationists. And cessationists say that miracles like the ones demonstrated by the apostles, by Jesus, uh, the Old Testament, it's, they're over. There's no more miracles. And then you have the non-cessationists. And, and that's another extreme. They say everything God does, it's just miracles and we just need to preach miracles. We cannot put God in a box. Uh, there is no box. And, uh, and, and uh, there's, we have two extreme positions. Now, that's theology. Let me talk to you about my God. My God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Some people will say, oh, only if God will perform a sign, a miracle, a wonder, we will all believe. However, the Israelites, as we read from the Bible, they were walking in miracles and they didn't believe. And even when Jesus was res resurrecting people, doing all sorts of miracles, people wouldn't believe. So Jesus performed countless miracles. However, the majority of people didn't believe him. They crucified him. So Christianity, it's about miracles, but it's not about uh, advertising miracles. Because for some people, a miracle will bring them to the gospel. For some others, they really don't care. They don't believe it. They will see it, but they won't believe it. In my personal uh, case, when I accepted Christ, there was a miracle in, in, in me personally. I, I received a miraculous healing. Not only a miraculous healing, but I was delivered from drug addiction. And it didn't take me eight months. It was like, you know, an instant thing. It doesn't happen to everybody. I received that miracle. So to me, it's undeniable that God still does miracles. To me, it's undeniable that He did a miracle in my life. And in my personal experience, that miracle helped me really to cling to God and to say, I will never leave you, God. 
Now, for some others, it's not like this. So, uh, the way we should present the Gospel, we need to present the full scope of the Gospel. Because some people, they need the miracles, the signs and the wonders. Some, for some others, they're meaningless. Now, in John 4, 48, that's the New Living Translation, Jesus asked, Will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? So, so here's he talking to people that will only believe unless they see signs and wonders. That's one of the crowds. But there's different crowds also. Now let me quote, this is not, not the Bible, it's from a quote from C.S. Lewis that I, I, I really, really like his writings. He said, if a man had no conception of a regular order in nature, then of course he could not notice departures from that order. When the disciples saw Christ walking on the water, they were frightened. They would not have been frightened unless they had known the laws of nature and known that this was an exception. And when we talk about miracles, miracles are an exception. So some people think, oh, we're going to walk in miracles, just miracle after miracle after miracle. And for the last 2,000 years of Christianity, there's people talking about this. It never happened. Now there are seasons, and I've seen seasons, of extraordinary miracles. That's what caused the unbelievable growth of church in South America. I mean, we, we think that the United States are a Christian nation. You should go to Brazil to see what a Christian nation really is. You, you think about, uh, you know, uh, uh, churches that have the authority to, to call the president and say, you want to prove the law on abortion. You want to prove the law on gay marriage. You cannot do that in the United States or Canada, but in some, certain of these countries, they do. And politicians tremble because they know they cannot be elected without the Christians. So, so uh, when we think about these things and the influence of church, it's not just about miracles, but are, there are extraordinary exploits. Now let me talk about the science of miracles. Scientific laws, they do not control events. A scientific law will not control an event. They're a record of the event. So the law of gravity doesn't control gravity, describes gravity. The laws of logic also have a standard. And there's laws of nature. But God is above all these laws. God has the supreme power over all the laws. Science doesn't. Science uh, uh, tries to explain things by observation. But God can suspend the laws of nature because He designs them. Now, let me go to the second point now. And, and if you can grasp something out of today, uh, just take this sentence with you. We're going to talk about an exploit. That's not necessarily a miracle. And here's my quote for today. God is not impressed with miracles. He makes them. But He is pleased with exploits. We make them. You think we can read this together? Can we read this together? All right, so let, let's read it together. God is not impressed with miracles. He makes them. But He is pleased with exploits. We make them. So I hope you can see the difference. Because when He talks about doing exploits, it's not talking about doing miracles. But it's talking about doing something that comes out of your imagination. That's impossible or too high for what what is humanly possible, and then you achieve it. And God is really pleased when we do exploits. Or do you think when there's a miracle that happens, that God says, oh, look at that, look at that. You know, Ben prayed for that person, and there's a miracle. I was so excited. You think God, God is that excited? No, we are excited. We are excited. We enjoy seeing God, you know, transforming people, healing people. Sometimes it's unbelievable, right? Yeah. And we're believers, and sometimes we see certain miracles and say, wow, how did that happen? I didn't see that, that coming. You know, when I, when I was traveling one of my uh, latest trips to, to Africa, and we were going to preach in a, in a new church. There's a pastor who was starting a congregation, and uh, we planted a, a, a church that became a movement over there. And, uh, and uh, I used to travel uh, many times to that, to that church. And, uh, and we were talking with the pastor, and he's telling us, 
oh, you know, we're going to open that, uh, it's the, 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 the inauguration of the new place, but something terrible happened, you know, that the, the most, one of the most influential guys in the church died, you know, he died two days ago, they're preparing the funeral, maybe we're not going uh, to do this, and then the communist uh, chief of police, he's opposing, and we have all these difficulties, and uh, we just prayed, and we prayed with the pastor, and that man, full of faith, went back to the place, entered the funeral home, and full of faith, he said to the dead body, Rise and leave! And the dead, dead, the dead man came to life. Wow. Awesome. The dead man came to life. Man. And then the next day he came, and here we are, you know, the pastor's coming from Canada, and we're here with the, you know, with the local leadership, and the guy says, a miracle, a miracle, a miracle, and the miracle happened. And I was scheduled to preach at the inauguration. It was my, the easiest message of my life. <laughs> you know, I didn't prepare a, a slideshow. You cannot prepare a slideshow for Africa. I didn't prepare anything. God just gave me a verse. Whoever believes in me, even if you're, if you're, if you're dead, you come to life. And I preach that message and I, I present the dead man. Uh, this guy, you he, know, he's, uh, he's South Africa, he's black, but he's kind of more pale. <laughs> he's not white, but he's very pale, but he's alive. The next day, we, the chief of police was there, the sorcerer was there, they gave their lives to Christ, the message was like 15 minutes, and then praying for people, and God did amazing miracles that day. Fantastic things that the Lord did, and then, then we said, okay, tomorrow we're going to baptize the dead man in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> city of Bengala in, a, in, a, in Angola. And so we went to the Atlantic Ocean and we baptized that guy. And I have the pictures and all these. What an amazing thing. What an amazing exploit. But it's on the level that I believe in resurrection, but uh, until that point, I've never seen such a powerful one. Because he was dead for three days. And he smelled. It's Africa. And he smelled, and this guy came to life, and, and the whole uh, region, the whole village, it's a suburb of the main town, they all believed. And that church now is a huge church, because of that miracle, the church did an exploit. They planted a church in a place where, uh, you know, the, the, the laws of nature were completely changed. Now, here you see our team, the Canadians, and some of you are not Canadians. <laughs> And here's the maple leaves. Now let me uh, elaborate on this. If the Canadians win the Stanley Cup, will that be a miracle? <laughs> let me elaborate on this. <laughs> now if the maple leaves win the Stanley Cup, that will be a miracle. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, but you see, in our language, we use it. But let me ask you, is it possible for the Canadians to win the Stanley Cup? Yes. Is it possible for the Maple Leafs to win the Stanley Cup? No. <laughs> that will be a miracle. Now, but you see, in our language, we use the word, the word miracle for so many things that are not a miracle. Are an exploit. So, let me put it this way. If the Canadians win the Stanley Cup, that's an exploit. Right? If the Maple Leafs win, that's a huge exploit. <laughs> but that's an exploit. So I, I want you just to see the difference between an exploit and a miracle. Because sometimes we call miracle to things that people do. We call miracle to things that humanly are not likely, but they, they're possible. Yeah. Now, an exploit, and what God is talking up, counting on us, it's not to do miracles. He's the one who does miracles. He's coming on you and me to do exploits. So that's why the Bible verse doesn't say that the people that uh, love their God, they, they will do miracles, but they say they will do exploits. All right, so let me go to my third point. Why should we expect the, the exploits to happen? Because our language of faith should always see further and bigger. We have an imagination, and it, we can imagine big things. But God can do bigger than your imagination. In Ephesians 3.20 it says, Now all glory to God, who is able, through His mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask 
or think. So in your wildest dreams, you know, you can sit down and imagine things. And I'm sure it came to mind, I'm not telling you to play 649, but I'm sure it happened to you. You see this week, jackpot, 50 million, and you sit down and think, what would I do with 50 million? <laughs> and you start thinking on how to spend 50 million. <laughs> and when you get halfway, you say, I don't think 50 million is enough for me. <laughs> I think I need 100 million. And you know, 50 million are going to go fast, you know? So uh, let me tell you this. Uh, sometimes we kind of limit God because we think that our imagination is so big, you know, we can, we can imagine big things. But God looks at what we imagine and He says, that's so small. But at least you think big, so let me do it bigger than what you ask or think. Because if we're limited by our imagination, we're limiting God. God doesn't want to do this. No, uh, this is the King James translation. It says, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Isn't that amazing? Uh, uh, exceedingly abundantly. So God is unlimited. So some translations, some translations don't say exceedingly abundantly, but they say infinitely more than what we ask or think. So God is unlimited, and He's able to do exceedingly, that means to go beyond, to surpass, abundantly, which is a great quantity, in great quantity, well supplied, richly supplied, above all that's higher than anything. It's above anything. So God is able to do this. Will He do it in your life? Now that's the big, that's, that's the 50 million dollar question. Will He do it in my life? I know it's written here in the Bible. God, will you do this in my life? And let me tell you, He won't if your faith is not there. Amen. And here is where we need to raise the bar and expect truly the best. And how we do this, it's a matter of discipline. Don't talk negative things over your life. Don't talk negative things over your country, over your nation. Don't talk negative things over anything. Just discipline yourself to bless. Do exceedingly, abundantly and above. Now, in John 14, 12, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, and even greater works, because I'm going to be with the Father. Again, it's not greater miracles, it's greater works. So, what's the difference? Because he's talking about greater exploits. That's, that's the Tony translation. He will do greater exploits. So, we're not going to do bigger miracles, you can't. You can't do bigger miracles than Jesus. You think you can do bigger miracles? Honestly, you know, spitting on the floor, on the ground, grab the mud, put the mud in the, in the blind man's eyes, and poof, there's eyes there. You think you're going to do that? Or the guy comes stuttering, and Jesus pulls him and spits in his mouth. And the guy's talking. <laughs> You may try, you may be slapped or something, but, uh, but you know, you're not going to do bigger miracles, you're going to do bigger works, bigger exploits. Why bigger? Everything's bigger in our world, right? The world is growing, the world is expanding, and because of this expansion, we need to be ready to do greater works. Final point, let's talk about our exploits in Quebec. You think, uh, you think Quebec cannot receive an exploit? Yeah. Let me mention to you something that um, uh, really stirred my heart when I came to the Lord, which is church planting. I love church planting. I was meditating on the first church we planted in a little town in the mountains of Portugal. It was a stronghold for Roman Catholicism, but that one that is really fanatic, that you know people are so fanatic, that if you come with the Bible, they'll burn the Bible. And this happened to us. 
So we went to this little town and it was, it was called Nobody Can Plant a Christian Church in this town. It's impossible. And that's where the Lord took us, to do our first exploit for Him. And it took us a lot of time. It took us at least two years waking up at 5 a.m. with a huge tent that we put it on the, on the local market, on the farmer's market. And we had Bibles and Christian music on that tent. And we handled uh, flyers to everyone that passed. 2,000 one day, 3,000 the other day. If we had help, sometimes you through the mission will come to help us. And then we will give 5,000 in that day. And we gave flyers, we gave flyers. And then we rented the place. And uh, I played the guitar because they were the musicians. And I started the worship time. And there was myself, my wife, and uh, two little kids <laughs> running around. <coughs> and I would start singing, and it full of energy, and nobody was there. And suddenly, one person started to arrive, and then we had three people. That's a revival! Wow! <laughs> and, uh, you know, and we endured, and uh, we were discouraged sometimes. And then, uh, you, uh, you know, people there, literally the Gideons were, went there to, to distribute Bibles to students. And the teachers in secondary school, they burned more than a thousand New Testaments in the yard. And they called all the students to burn the Bibles uh, in the schoolyard. So that's how tough the place was. And we opened this storefront right across from the Roman Catholic Church. I had to choose the worst place. <laughs> because when they did the procession and they gathered thousands and thousands of people, they would stop on a Sunday, in front of the storefront, and we were there doing spiritual warfare, and we will see the idols stop there, and on purpose, they will stop there for 15 minutes, praying the rosary, so the evil evangelical church will stop. But God did a miracle. That, that uh, fanatic priest was removed, God brought another priest, and that priest started to say good things about us. So after a long season of planting the church there, now the Roman Catholic priest was preaching on the radio about our faith, how our faith was better than the faith of the people of their his own congregation. He was going out for breakfast with me, sending people for counseling because he would tell me, you know, Pastor Tony, I was never married. How can I give advice to married people? So I'm sending them to you. And, and the whole atmosphere changed and the church started to grow, and the church was planted there. So I, I didn't plan to talk about all this, but I, I'd like to mention this to you because this was my beginning. But my end is going to be better than my beginning. <laughs> and you know what, here, the place where we are at, this is an exploit. And you did this exploit. Think about it, the simple fact that you are here, this place is an exploit. Why is this an exploit? Because I was told for a year and a half, that no, it's impossible to have a church on this boulevard. I was told over and over and over, it's impossible. City Hall will never allow a church on a main street uh, here in, in, uh, in this area. Never. If you go to a side street, maybe they'll close their eyes. If you go, you know, inside the neighborhood, out of sight, maybe they'll close your eyes. On the main street, never. And for a year and a half, I went practically everywhere until God gave us the plan on how to do a church for people that don't like church. We don't put the church sign outside uh, just on Sundays, but we can have four churches, four services going on here every Sunday, almost every day of the week. We have people praying, we have things happening here. God is doing amazing things. This is an exploit. And you might say, well, no, well, it's a church where I came on Sunday. This church is an exploit. You're part of the exploit. The reason why this place is here, it's because of you. Planting churches, it's planting people. And I'd like to tell you what, what is the, the prayer goal for 2015. We would like Passion Canada to plant six churches until the end of the year. Amen. Now you're looking at me. <laughs> We would like to plant six churches, six, over here until the end of the year, here in Quebec, here in Montreal, if possible. Do you think it's possible? Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, come on. 
Well, if you're going to, let's say, if you talk to the pastors of churches that are already here for a long period, and if you tell them, you think your church could plant six churches until the end of the year, you know what the answer will be? <coughs> I'm not trying to put anyone down, but I, let me tell you something. When we live in an atmosphere of faith, yeah. when we expect the best, we say six and God say, says 60. All right. We say we're going to do six and God says, wow, I like that, but I'm going to help you to do a little bit better because our God is able to do way above, exceedingly, you know, infinitely more than what we ask or think. But notice the premise is that you, that you need to ask or think. If you don't even dare to think about it, or if you say, Pastor, don't say that, shh, shh, it might not happen. It will look bad if we are right to the end of 2015 and nothing happens. I don't care if it looks bad or not. I believe that until the end of the year, we're going to plant at least six churches. And I say, God surprises. And let me tell you, your part of the vision and the dream. And just the simple fact that you're here, you support with your prayers, you support financially, you support with your gifts, you're part of this dream. A church plant in a difficult area is an exploit. That's the end of my message. Now, next week, I'm, we're going to go into details on how to do an exploit. And because I don't want to talk just about what a church does, we're going to go into an exploit, a personal exploit. What is a personal exploit? Some of you have been praying for your family to be saved. Nothing is happening. It's not enough to pray. You need to do something. We're going to learn about this. Okay? Some of you have been limited because you say, Oh, I would like to, uh, you know, to do a missionary trip. I'd like to do this, but I don't have money. God has a lot of money. God has a lot of money. And I'm going to tell you how to book the ticket, how to prepare the flight, and how to go without money. 